ممتاز تفضل اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم يا جماعه uh, دكتور ايمن ثانك يو سو ماتش فور ذا انفيتيشن اند اي هوب ذس ليتل برزنتيشن ويل اوبن سم كورنرز and uh, put, shed lights on some important aspects on acute coronary syndromes with s it's very important and we'll touch on uh, a primary uh, angioplasty for s elevation mi first of all i have to make a declaration that uh, yes i have act I've actively participated in research projects with grants from qcrc qnrf Leeds university and uh, Hamilton Research Institute, there we are in Canada, uh, with funds in different assignments as a co-investigator, principal investigator, and lead investigator. But none of these have any conflict of interest related to this presentation. Uh, a word of thanks is uh, due for the uh, Libyan Cardiac Society for giving me this opportunity to meet with uh, wonderful colleagues and not present, but have a discussion Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Dr. Ayman Smer for uh, wonderful work, hard work, continuous work, relentless work to get these presentations together. Thank you so much, Dr. Ayman. I also would like to uh, thank the expert panel, Dr. Adel Munsur, Dr. Fatih Idris, Dr. Mahmoud, but also now joined us, and I'm very pleased, uh, Dr. Abdul Ghani. Uh, I hope I'll do justice to this presentation. It, the, my talk is based mainly on uh, guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology in 2017 on for ST elevation myocardial infarction and 2020 guidelines for non-ST elevation MI. But when necessary, I have also included points from the American College of Cardiology. And luckily overall, the uh, guidelines are similar across the Atlantic. The objective of this uh, little presentation is to review some of the fundamental evidence-based principles in the management of acute coronary syndromes, S between brackets, to review some of the fundamental, again, evidence-based principles in perfusion therapy for S elevation MI, and uh, we'll touch on some very important time intervals and explain them because sometimes they're a little bit confusing to achieve successful primary PCI. And lastly, how has COVID-19 affected STEMI uh, management worldwide? You might think it has not, but uh, research shows it has. This is a famous uh, diagram from uh, Bronwell textbook of heart disease uh, where uh, progression of vascular disease in general, but here we're talking about coronary artery disease from one to six. One is normal coronaries. And then, then the, the position of lipids and lipid laid uh, cells, inflammatory reactions, and the number three, there's a buildup of atheroma. Atheroma in number four gets worse. And here people may start getting angina, but when this plaque ruptures in number five, that's when uh, uh, the problem of acute coronary syndrome starts, either ST elevation or non-ST elevation. Some patients die at this point, some survive and heal the lesions either with a blocked or open artery. But what uh, uh, in, is not clear from Brownwell's figure is that many patients actually stay normal, number one. And some patients get angina and never develop acute coronary syndrome. Furthermore, there's a lot of research to show that as well as progression, there are methods and success ways to do regression of coronary artery disease. So it's, uh, it's not an inevitable one-way direction. Um, this is a picture of a patient who never had myocardial infarction. He had angina. You can see the, the, the plaque, although occluded, narrowing most of the uh, coronary artery lumen, but it's a heart plaque that, is, that has low risk of rupture. This is unlike this plaque here, even though it's not causing as much stenosis, but you can see the plaque is very soft with a thin cap. This is the sort of, uh, cap, uh, this is the sort of plaque uh, that is uh, very vulnerable for acute coronary syndrome. The first patient may 
may have angina, but they're less likely to develop acute myocardial infarction. And that, therefore, I'd like to emphasize here that there isn't strict relationship between severity of lesion and the risk of developing acute coronary syndrome. There are slightly different issues. And the culprit, uh, the culprit issue that initiates uh, acute coronary syndrome is the ulceration of the entoma and the rupture of the plaque. And as you can see here, this is an, actually a sample from the aorta, but in essence, this is what, what uh, happens. When this happens, when the ulceration happens, the platelets interpret this, think this is a wound. This is an injury to the vessel. And the normal reaction of platelets will be to accumulate, to try and, uh, to try and close that wound. But in so doing, they actually start closing the coronary artery and causing acute coronary syndrome. So the platelets are not being naughty when they accumulate on the ulcerated plaque. They are not uh, doing something wrong as far as they're concerned when they're causing acute myocardial infarction. They think they are healing an injury to the, to the vessel, to the coronary artery. Uh, acute coronary syndrome has been classified in many ways, but today we, uh, by and large, we depend on the ECG. On the left side, upper, you can see a normal uh, ECG with the ST segment isoelectric with the rest of the isoelectric line. Uh, next to it here, you can see clear ST elevation uh, that is the hallmark of ST elevation myocardial infarction. On the right side here is the non-ST elevation syndrome, let's call it, because that would include unstable angina and myocardial infarction. This can present as simply acute ST depression or acute inversion. In fact, in old times, and I'm old, in old times, we used to call non-ST elevation MI the symmetrical T-wave inversion MI. Uh, because there was symmetrical T-wave inversion. And to uh, just put it in uh, uh, perspective, patients were presenting with uh, symptoms compatible with acute coronary syndrome, that's chest pain, compatible with uh, myocardial ischemia, do ECG as soon as possible. And your aim is to try, if possible, to recognize if there is any possibility of ST elevation myocardial infarction because time matters most in ST elevation myocardial infarction. It doesn't matter, it, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter as much for non ST elevation myocardial infarction. And non ST elevation, I'm sorry, a non ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, if the troponin is raised, we call it non ST elevation myocardial infarction. If the troponin is normal, then we call it unstable angina. Obviously, also, you have to think of alternative diagnosis, particularly if the ACG is normal, like, for example, aortic dissection. So if the ACG is normal and the chest pain is, uh, uh, there is chest pain, but the troponin is negative, that is, does not necessarily mean everything is fine and go home. Anyway, the, the pathophysiology of ST elevation myocardial infarction has been shown in pathological studies, mainly postmortem studies, and the, the conclusion is that in majority of first elevation myocardial infarction, there's a large occlusive fibrin rich, and I emphasize fibrin rich, and you'll understand why soon, fibrin rich thrombus. And the, on the ECG, you'll see the ST elevation that is, we have already described, but quite often you also see uh, ST depression in the opposite leads so-called reciprocal changes or mirror MR changes. Um, the recognition of ST elevation myocardial infarction that necessitates reperfusion is chest pain that's not relieved by nitroglycerin. But even if it's not relieved by nitroglycerin and the ST elevation remains, that, the, that is a call for treatment. S elevation of more than one millimeter, and you know the chest leads and the limb leads. New left bundle branch block, but also please don't ignore new right bundle branch block 
in some work that we have done, right on the branch block, we have published this work, right on the branch block, particularly with anterior myocardial infarction, has a worse prognosis than left bundle branch block. And we will touch on true posterior myocardial infarction in a little while. Um, just I'll take a little deviation. Do you know the five sites listed as World Heritage by UNESCO in Libya? Well, these sites are, I'm sure you already predicted, the archaeological sites of Leptis Magna, the archaeological site of Sabrata, the rock art uh, site of mountains of Akakus, the archaeological site of uh, Siren, which is Shahad, and the old town of Damas. And I'm sure if we do some good job, we can add other sites because there's plenty there. Okay, well, this is the, uh, the, the uh, UNESCO World Heritage in Akakus uh, uh, Mountains. And it has one of the oldest uh, paint paintings and carvings as you can see here on the bottom, the carving suggests a giraffe, and then the carving here suggests a mammoth. Uh, these carvings, they said to be about 12,000 years ago. It's, uh, 12, so it's a very, very long time. And it's one of the oldest. Amazing thing is that they are done with color. Okay. The reperfusion therapy for acute acetylation myocardial infarction includes pharmacological therapy, which is thrombolytic or fibrinolytic therapy that we'll talk about. The interventional primary PCI, which is the first choice, if at all possible. And the other one is the pharmacointerventional. The pharmacointerventional or facilitated PCI is when fibrinolytic is administered first, and if it fails, or chest pain continues, or ST elevation does not resolve, uh, refer to PCI. A routine uh, PCI after every uh, fibrinolytic therapy immediately after generally is not accepted in the guidelines. Okay, well, there are a few names that I'd like to introduce to you. Uh, the primary PCI is the intervention perfusion therapy, which is given immediately without uh, thrombolytic therapy. Rescue PCI is uh, PCI intervention in cases where the thrombolytic therapy has failed to give clinical benefit. And by that, we mean re relief of chest pain, resolution of the ST segment, and if there are complications like arrhythmia, disappearance of the complications. Facilitated uh, PCI, I've just explained, and its routine use is not uh, recommended but necessary use is highly recommended. Um, Thromboid therapy is, has been with us for a long time. I was part of this ISIS-2 trial. I'm not part of ISIS. I'm not part of, I was part of ISIS-2 trial with Peter, uh, Professor Peter Slide. Uh, this is in the 80s, early 80s. At the same time, there was the GOSTO trial, later rather, later GOSTO trial and the GC, the Italian trial, at the same time, but the conclusion is about the same. Uh, in, in this, there are some important lessons. If you look at uh, uh, the, the reduction in mortality or the mortality with streptokinase, it's reduced from 13% in placebo arm to 10%, and that's 25% relative uh, risk reduction. If you look at the aspirin alone, Please, this is aspirin without uh, without thrombolytic therapy. It reduces the mortality by almost the same. So please pay attention to this very cheap medication that can be easily administered and it does not need a cat lab. And if you combine the two in the uh, and the other arm of the ISIS-2 trial, the reduction of mortality was uh, up down to eight percent, which is a relative risk reduction of fifty-three percent. Very significant, and this was uh, big news at the time. For thrombolytic therapy, in fact, for primary PCI as well to be effective, one of the most important factors is time. Time is muscle, and time is our responsibility. Once the patient is in our hands, 
time is our responsibility. Before the patient comes, it can be the responsibility of the patient himself delaying coming to the hospital, or it can be the responsibility of the ambulance being too slow or um, not uh, taking the patient seriously. But once the patient is in our hand, time is our responsibility. And why is it so important? Because if you look here, this is the survival after a stimulation myocardial infarction in two years, four years, six years, and eight years. This is Kaplan curve. And you can see the survival benefit of those patients who received thrombotherapy within two hours of chest pain as, as opposed to patients who just a couple of hours later, two to four hours, or more than six hours. So time is extremely important in thrombotherapy, and you will see also for primary PCI. Uh, I'm sure everybody aware, but uh, I'm presenting this as Dr. Ayman uh, advised me uh, to take in consideration everybody on the floor. And therefore, I'm presenting it more like the way I present board reviews for our fellows. Uh, these are the absolute contraindications for fabric therapy, uh, basically intracranial hemorrhage. At any time, ischemic stroke in the last six months, central venous damage or neoplasms or AB malformation, recent major trauma or surgery within the last one month, gastrointestinal bleeding within last one month, uh, non-bleeding disorder, but not, uh, ministerial, not ministerial bleeding, because ministerial bleeding generally is not a contraindication for bleeding therapy. It's not an absolute contraindication. Aortic dissection, if you recognize aortic dissection, and incidentally, aortic dissection can, uh, uh, can present with a elevation myocardial infarction. And this is where we have to be clinicians and pay attention to the presentation. Um, lastly, if there's a puncture that is non-compressible, if the patient had a liver biopsy or a lumbar puncture uh, in the last in the last one one day. Okay, I will not go through the relative contraindications, but uh, uh, let's say now we have a patient with a stimulation myocardial infarction. Once you confirm the diagnosis and excluded contraindications, load the, load the patient with aspirin and P2Y12 inhibitor. For if your patient is going for primary PCI, the preferred uh, dual antiplatelet therapy is prasugrel or ticagrelor. Or if, if not available, then clopidogrel. The preferred heparin is unfractionated heparin for primary PCI, but we will see low molecular weight heparin is for fibrinolytic therapy. But please, if you're sending the patient for primary PCI, don't give him uh, fondopexarine uh, because of incidences of catheter uh, thrombus. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a primary PCI on site, then that must be done immediately, and I will explain later within 60 minutes. If you think that you can trust, if the, you don't have primary PCI on your hospital, on your site, see if you can transfer that patient within 120 minutes. And it's usually worked out between hospitals if this is possible or not with the ambulance service and all that. If you think it's likely that you get the patient to primary PCI site within 120 minutes, do send the patient. If not, please give them thrombotherapy within 10 minutes. Remember that early thrombolysis is better than late uh, PCI. Uh, once you've done the thrombotherapy and stabilized the patient, do send the patient to a PCI facility for reasons that we'll explain later. Please do not wait for troponin when you have a elevation myocardial infarction. I have seen cases where some doctors were waiting for troponin to confirm this. Stimulus. Well, it's nice to confirm with a troponin, but it's not good for the patient. Okay, now I'm sure you've all heard of 10 minutes and 60 minutes and 90 minutes and 120 minutes. What, how all these uh, minutes? I'm trying here, I'll try here uh, to make sense of it all. If the, if the patient 
if the patient comes to a primary PCI facility, the bottom here, then please do the ECG. Always try and do the ECG within 10 minutes. This is the guidelines. And if the if is, patient is going to primary PCI, the door to balloon time should be less than 60 minutes. I mean, the institution which has primary PCI should aim to get uh, balloon dilatation, or now we're talking about wire crossing within 60 minutes. Uh, our time in our hospital is 27 minutes from the time the patient is in emergency. This is a patient who's coming direct to emergency. As I say, what are all these times and what do they mean? Okay, let's say the patient comes not to a primary PCI facility, he comes to a non-primary PCI hospital. Uh, ECG again must be done in, within 10, 10 minutes. If the patient can be transferred in less than 120 minutes to reach primary PCI site, then do transfer the patient. And the accepted time for patient transferred from non-PCI to a PCI is 90 minutes. Can you say 90 minutes if you're transferring a patient from your institution to a PCI institution is 90 minutes, but if the patient lands in a primary PCI, 60 minutes. If you think that this time is going to take more than 120 minutes in transport, then uh, give him the fibrillar therapy, and that should, should not be delayed more than 10 minutes. So this is where they come. Now, I'd like to take you, please, at the bottom of the slide here, the time from chest pain until the patient comes to the hospital or calls for uh, EMS, this is called patient delay. Once the patient has called or has reached the hospital, it's our responsibility. That's called system delay. If you add the two together, that's the total ischemic time. And that is what really is killing the myocardium, the total ischemic time. Patient delay, we will see how we reduce that. System delay, I'm sure you've already worked it out. So, but in one word, if you forget all the numbers, in STEMI, be as fast as possible. Make your decisions fast to transfer the patient for primary PCI. Make your decision to give proper analysis, either one or the other, try and do it as fast as possible. In, in, our, um, uh, in our program, in our primary PCI program, uh, we have the wireless the ACG transatellite, trans trans it's high fidelity, high resolution ECG transfer from the ambulance to the hospital. At the same time, it goes to the consultant's mobile and uh, the patient, by the time the patient arrives to the hospital, the cat lab staff is already, are already there and the consultant is already there. And that is why our uh, uh, door to balloon time is very short or this is one of the reasons why it's too short. What should you do if a patient, you've given a patient thrombolytherapy? Well, the guidelines say, number one, if you can uh, give primary PCI option, that's the best. If the patient received thrombolysis, all these patients should be transferred after thrombolysis, after stabilization into uh, a PCI facility. Not necessarily to do PCI in the same night, but when do you do PCI the same night? If the patient develops heart failure or cardiogenic shock, if the, if the, if the ECG and the chest pain show that the, the uh, thrombolytic therapy has actually failed, this 50% ST segment resolution has not been achieved, patient may be hemodynamically unstable, or the chest pain is getting worse. Um, the, uh, when the, when, when the uh, cat lab do angiography, they'll do it for the infarct-related vessels of infarct-related artery if indicated, and this should be done between two to 24 hours. Um, you've got to remember the, also there's a small risk of increased bleeding if you do angiography shortly after fibrinolysis. Well, please, for our, especially for our younger fellows, uh, medical students, and uh, new graduates in the, on the floor, please don't miss these two ECGs, because if you miss them, you can miss important STEMI. 
What are they? This is one of them, the first one. You can notice here, there isn't very impressive ST elevation. There's a little bit of ST elevation in AVR, a little bit of ST elevation in, uh, in uh, V1. But there is massive, widespread ST depression in almost all the other leads. The guidelines say, say a steep depression in eight or more leads. Uh, this quite often indicates either left main serious obstruction or severe multivessel disease. So please don't miss this ECG. Don't miss it. Definitely don't miss it if I am your examiner in the, uh, um, in the board exam, because this is important. Okay, uh, this is a Damas in the south uh, southwest of the country, and uh, it's one of the five UNESCO listed uh, World Heritage Sites. The other uh, ECG, which is ST elevation, but it may not look like ST elevation, is posterior myocardial infarction. Posterior myocardial infarction fools you by giving you ST depression where there should be a ST elevation. Uh, and this patient has as well, uh, right on the branch block. But you can see here in V1 and V2, a ST depression. Little bit of a ST elevation in the lateral leads, a little bit of a ST elevation, not diagnostic. Quite often, posterior myocardial infarction is associated with inferior myocardial infarction. And if it's associated with inferior myocardial infarction, it's easy to recognize it's easy to recognize and hard to miss. Why there is ST depression in the V1, V2 when there's myocardial, posterior myocardial infarction? Because you're putting your leads anteriorly when the infarction is actually taking place posteriorly and therefore you're seeing the mirror image. And here is the mirror image. If you turn V1, V2, V3 here, you will see the ST uh, elevation. Uh, think about it this way. Here is a V2, ST depression. If you look at the mirror image, you will see the ST elevation. And one way of uh, picking that ST elevation is to extend the leads from V6 to V7, V8, and V9, which is behind on the scapula. And if you do that, quite often you will pick ST depression in the anterior leads V1, V2, V3, but quite often you'll be lucky to pick up ST elevation and you make the diagnosis of this very important condition that is very, very much treatable either by primary PCI thrombolysis. But if you discover uh, the, this next day, I'm afraid the patient has lost a very important part of his myocardium. Okay, so far about ST elevation myocardial infarction. What about non ST elevation acute coronary syndromes? Um, as I mentioned earlier, that includes non ST elevation myocardial infarction and unstable angina. The difference is troponin. Well, earlier thinking about non ST elevation myocardial infarction, well, if thrombolytic therapy has worked so well for ST elevation myocardial infarction, why don't we try it for non ST elevation myocardial infarction? After all, it's another infarction. And this was addressed by uh, an important study called the TB3B trial, um, Eric to Paul. Um, and they have looked at days after enrollment up to about a year. And actually the mortality was a little bit higher in patients who received uh, thrombolytic therapy, RTPA in this case, uh, than even placebo. And it's higher all the way through except the very, very couple of, first couple of days. But this was not significant. So overall, thrombolytic therapy is out for non elevation myocardial infarction. Let's touch on a couple of examples of ST elevation myocardial infarction. Here's a 34-year-old male. He's a smoker. He's hemodynamically stable, bonified anterior myocardial infarction in the ECG. Where is the occluded vessel? Quite often, the vessels are occluded at the ostium, and therefore, you may even miss them. You may think this is the LAD here, LAD, and this is the circ, and that's it, and there's no occluded vessel. But if you look very carefully, the LED is actually totally occluded. 
and you just see a little bit of uh, um, a little bit of a stump at the beginning. And uh, in, uh, this is in the spider view, and you can see it much more clear. Uh, here, a stamp being placed after recanalization with a wire. The wire you can see here is actually in diagonal, is not in mainstream LED, but for speed, if the wire is in diagonal, it's not interfering with your placement of your stamp, that's all fine. But if it is very close and it may interfere with placement of scent or cause dissection into that a branch, let's try and reposition your wire. Uh, you can see the other vessels. This is the Ramus, this is the Cirque uh, in good shape. So essentially this is, uh, this is primary PCI. Here is the result. This, no, I'm sorry, this is before. And this is the final, this is also, okay, we can't see the final result, but the final result shows that the vessel has cleared. Okay, uh, the primary PCI it did not have a smooth rise into the field of cardiology. Because if you look back in 1994, when primary PCI was tried and compared to thrombolytic therapy, the mortality was actually higher in primary PCI than thrombolytic therapy. The gray is thrombolytic therapy mortality of 10%, primary PCI mortality of 14%. And the reason for this is that uh, thrombolytic therapy was given fast, Primary PCI, people took their time because it was right at the beginning and would not appreciate the crucial time for primary PCI. By the time they got the, they got the, the cat lab team and all that, they did the primary PCI. So there was a difference, a discrepancy between the time in fibrinolysis and primary PCI in favor of thrombolytic therapy. But when uh, efforts were made to get patients uh, earlier, and do the primary PCI in shorter time, then in 1995, 1996, 1997, 1998, there's already a, gr a great difference between mortality of 12% in uh, thrombotherapy and 3.8% in the primary PCI. Somebody may say, why is it 12% mortality here and it's only 10% mortality here? Because these are different population. These are different population of patients. Um, and very important finding from the Prague study, uh, and this was earlier on and confirmed later by other studies, is that the higher the risk of the patient, the more benefit of primary PCI. For example, in diabetic patients, if you look at the difference in non-diabetic patients, mortality with thrombolytic therapy is 12.8, mortality with primary PCI, uh, 8.6 is significant a diff, uh, relative risk reduction of about 30%. But look when you give diabetic patients, diabetic patients do not do too well on thrombolytic therapy overall, not every patient, but overall. The mortality is about 24% and the mortality uh, uh, with primary PCI is 7.9%. And it's greatly significant. So the point here I'm trying to make is that the higher the risk of the patient, the non the acylivation myocardial infarction patient, the greater the benefit from primary PCI. And this has been confirmed by many studies. This is one of those which concluded that the higher risk group uh, during acylivation MI, the greater is the benefit from primary angioplasty. Okay, now a question which quite often uh, is raised and it's in debate in most conferences today is, okay, you find a occluded vessel in primary PCI. Uh, what do you do with the other vessels if they are diseased? Um, and these are the guidelines. Uh, basically, a routine uh, angioplasty for uh, non-infarct vessels uh, is, is, is not a must during the procedure, but you can do it a uh, little later. 
However, if the patient has cardiogenic shock or if the patient has uh, uh, cardiogenic shock, then it is advisable, it's recommended that you do uh, PCI to the other vessels in addition to the infarct vessel. Okay, I'll take a couple of minutes here to give you a break online. Uh, I'm sure you all you recognize this building here, this wonderful building, uh, which every time I go to uh, Tripoli, I visit. And this is uh, the Arch of Marcus Aurelius, uh, the great, one of the greatest emperors. He's listed as one of the greatest nine emperors of Rome of all times, beside Julius Caesar and all that. Um, uh, locally, they call it uh, the Marble Arch or the Marble Depot. Depot. Behind it here, do you recognize this mosque here? This is uh, Masjid Gurji. One of the admirals was rescued Tripoli uh, from invaders. Anyway, this is uh, person acting Marcus Aurelius, and I'm sure you've seen the film Gladiator. Now, why I'm saying I'm talking about Gladiator? Because in Gladiator, Marcus Aurelius is the old man, is the old emperor, the world wise emperor. He was also a poet. Uh, a very wise man, uh, uh, but his son was not like that. In 1980, Marcus Aurelius died. Some say that his son may have had uh, to do with his death, but uh, his son is called Commodus, and I'm sure you remember his picture in uh, Gladiator. Immediately after Marcus Aurelius died, uh, Commodus uh, became um, became emperor, and he was not as wise as his father. He was very wasteful. Uh, he, he did not take off care of the uh, of the people, the Roman uh, citizens, and uh, was very wasteful. He uh, was assassinated twelve years later, on the thirty first of December, the night of thirty first of December, nineteen ninety two. In the same night, he was actually planning to kill many senates including his sister. It was his sister who found a list he has written for the people to be killed and who's going to kill them. And her name was one of them, her, her, name, her and her husband. Um, after he was killed, the next year, the 1993, uh, was a chaos year. Rome was in chaos. The whole empire was in chaos. So much so that five emperors, five emperors ruled one after the other in that year. And that's why it's in history, it's called the year of the five emperors. Uh, until it was all brought together into order by one of the best emperors of Rome. And can anybody guess who is that? It's Septimus Severus. Uh, Septimus Severus, his father was a general, uh, and he is half Libyan. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's said that his mother is Roman and his father was a general, but he was of Punic origin, uh, Phoenician um, origin, or maybe the mother was Phoenician, but he was half-blood Phoenician. That's why he's actually called the, uh, the, uh, the Dark Emperor. He was dark-skinned, as most Libyans are. Anyway, uh, Septimus Severus was born in Leptis Magna, and he took a great care of Leptis Magna, and a lot of the uh, architecture that you see in Leptis Magna today is due to Septimus Severus. This is his statue, which used to be in uh, Martha's Square, and it's now moved to uh, Leptis Magna. And if you go to Leptis Magna, as you remember, there was a, an arch for Marcus Aurelius. There is a Leptis Magna, a great arch, which was built in honor of uh, Septimus Severus when he came as an emperor and visited Leptis Magna. This is the arch of Septimus Severus and Leptis Magna. Incidentally, Leptis Magna is one of the five World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. Okay, back to our uh, non-infact related arteries. He's, uh, here's an example of a 32-year-old gentleman who's diabetic, who came in with severe chest pain and his ECG shows 
massive anterior acceleration myocardial infarction. The patient was in cardiogenic shock, his blood pressure was very low, he was anuric, he was uh, clammy and sweaty, and his uh, oximetry was starting to fall. When this is his angiogram, which shows uh, LED here with a subtotal occlusion, a 99% stenosis, not total occlusion. Okay, well, that was easy to canalize and stent. And you can see the arm of the patient is in his chest because of chest pain. And this is the final result of TIMI3 flow. This is before and this is after. Well, the question is, why has this young man developed cardiogenic shock despite apparently only one and not even totally occluded coronary artery? Well, as a routine, every interventionist would do the right coronary artery. And here we are. The patient has totally occluded a right coronary artery and probably a, right, a large right coronary artery. This patient has never had chest pain before. His, his ECG uh, a year before was uh, entirely normal. So he may have had a silent myocardial infarction. Okay. Uh, the wire was uh, carefully threaded through the occlusion into the main vessel guided by the anatomy of the uh, right coronary artery in this view, but still there's no, no flow. Balloon dilatation, and after balloon dilatation, we're just starting to see on the right side here, the left side is the balloon dilatation. On the right side, you're just starting to see the uh, right coronary artery opening up. Anyway, after a further dilatation, stent was, was placed in the area of occlusion. And this is the final result. You can see how large this right coronary artery. And this is probably the reason why this patient was in cardiogenic shock despite subtotal occlusion of the LED. Uh, once the uh, stent was deployed with the TIMI3 flow now in the LED and the right coronary artery, he had very fast hemodynamic recovery. This is uh, Siren Shahat in the Green Mountain, and it has one of the oldest uh, mosaics, which much of it is preserved, and unfortunately some of it has gone. Well, let's take another example where a decision has to be made about non-infarct-related artery. This time it's a 65-year-old diabetic gentleman coming with anterior myocardial infarction, severe chest pain, but he's hemodynamically stable, despite the fact, as you'll see, he has multivessel coronary artery disease. Okay, you can see the left, left name is normal, but every other vessel is occluded. You may think this is the LED, but this is not the LED. As you can see here from the lateral view, the LED is occluded. And now in the spider view, you can see the LED is occluded, should be coming this way. And this is the occlusion of the LED. Okay, faced with this patient, should we send this patient to surgery or what should we do? The guidelines say open the infarct related vessel and then think about the next decision, the next step. Okay, the, the LED is being wired, but before we wire the LED, we wire the ramus to protect it. And this is the LED with a balloon inside. The wire is in the ramus. You can see now the LED opening up. Actually, we have used thrombus aspiration for this patient because the thrombus burden was large. And this is the final result. This is the final result. Okay, let's look at the right coronary artery again. The right coronary artery is with severe disease. So in patients like this, uh, do the infarct-related vessel, the related artery, and think about whether you will do PCI for the rest of the vessels, or you send the patients to uh, surgery. Now, if the infarct-related vessel is indeed the LED and it has been stented, 
generally we tend to try and avoid surgery. But if the LED was not the infarct related vessel, for example, he came with an inferior MI and we did the right coronary artery and there's an LED severe lesion, then we have to debate whether surgery is better or not, especially considering he's diabetic. There is a point to give him surgery. So these are the guidelines, again, as I explained. Okay. Dual antiplatelet therapy is quite often um, uh, mixed up a little bit in the mind of uh, our junior colleagues. The loading dose of aspirin and the maintenance dose is the same for fibrinolysis and primary PCI, 150 to 300 oral dose, or if you can give IV, it's 75 to 250 if the patient can't take orally, or if you have that available. In primary PCI, prasugrel, anticagrelol are the preferred agents. These are the uh, ESC guidelines, as well as the American guidelines, which is um, different to the, as I come to fibrinolysis. Heparin, we prefer unfractionated heparin, but low molecular weight also can be, can be given. Um, if prasugrel or ticagrelol is not available, and sometimes it's not available, uh, the loading dose, uh, standard loading dose used to be 300, but for primary PCI, uh, some studies have shown that 600 uh, milligrams is better than 300 milligram loading. And for the first week, 150 uh, milligrams is better than 75 milligrams. So the standard 600 milligrams 100, uh, loading, 150 milligrams for the first week, then 75 milligrams. Uh, Prasugrel, please remember that it's contraindicated in patients who had previous stroke, hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic, in fact, even TIAs, um, age of more than 75, and if the weight is too small, like less than 60 kilograms. Uh, Tecagrelol, uh, you may have already witnessed that some patients fe feel unexplained dyspnea when they are put on Tecagrelol after some time. Uh, Cangrelorol is, uh, uh, is a potent and it's given IV and it's, the, it's reversible. Uh, it's coming into the market, but it's not completely into the guidelines yet. For, uh, for fibrinolytic therapy, aspirin dose is the same. Clopidogrel is the recommended uh, uh, dual therapy and the loading dose for fibrinolytic therapy is 300, maintenance 75, and low molecular weight rather than unfractionated heparin. How long? How long should we give the dual antiplatelet therapy? I'm talking, please, about ST elevation myocardial infarction, and I'm gonna say why I'm saying this in a minute. For all STEMI patients, aspirin for life, if possible. For primary PCI, for one year, preferably prasugrel or ticagrelol, but if not available, clopidogrel is fine. Uh, if, a, if a patient has fibrinolysis followed by PCI, it's the same as primary PCI. In, uh, in high-risk patients, patients, for example, with a stent of the left main or multiple stents, may be considered longer uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. After thrombolysis, if there's no PCI, clopidogrel for one year, but if the patient received unlucky and received no thrombolysis and no PCI, minimum is one month, but better for 12 months. Patients who have high risk of bleeding, uh, six months dual antiplatelet therapy and then aspirin. Sometimes uh, patients can't stay as long as that because of recurrent bleeding and we ha may have to think. Uh, in patients who are at risk or have GI bleed, uh, please add PPI. And if you give PPI for, uh, uh, for a patient who is receiving clopidogrel, pentaprazole is, uh, is, has least interaction, drug interaction. In all, uh, all the guidelines, American, European, and others, uh, drug eluting stents is, is a recommended stent for primary PCI. However, if STEMI has a high risk of bleeding, it may be reasonable to use bare metal stent maybe balloon a lot only, but uh, at least bare metal stent uh, to reduce the duration of that. And that's particularly mentioned in the American guidelines. It's not mentioned in the European guidelines. Um, this is very important. I was doing round um, 
maybe um, two weeks ago or something like this. And I was coming out of a patient who had a cellivation myocardial infarction, and I told him that he need to be on dual antifractive therapy for a year. And if there's any reason to stop earlier, he must consult with us. As I was coming out, one of the younger doctors, he said to me, um, well, uh, I've heard, I've read an article where we can give antiplatelet therapy for one month or three months. And I immediately knew that he is, re he is uh, alluding to a recent study which published in Journal, uh, Journal of the American College of Cardiology, in, actually last month, uh, uh, October, although it's dated here in November, it was in October. And in that, it, uh, it concluded that uh, in patients with high-risk bleeding one month, dual antiplatelet therapy was associated with similar ischemic events, but lower risk of bleeding than if you give for three months. But please, this is not related to STEMI. This is related to stable patients, should not be mixed. So for STEMI, uh, STEMI patients, the recommendation, as I just mentioned. This is very good news for shorter uh, double antiplatelet therapy, particularly for patients with high risk bleeding, but it's not for STEMI and should not make, be mixed. Sobrata is another uh, World Health site by UNESCO, beautiful city, beautiful to see. Uh, incidentally, uh, Septimus Severus died uh, while invading uh, Britain, and he was one of the few, Hadrian was the other one, uh, he was one of the very few emperors who successfully invaded Britain, and he died in York. He died in York. And uh, my wife is from York, so I'm claiming my heritage. Anyway, um, my last section is about management of STEMI during the COVID pandemic. And what are the lessons? This is very nice. Uh, a review paper uh, published in Trends in Cardiovascular Medicine. And uh, it shows some stunning results. If you look in these countries, Austria, India, Italy, Spain, and United States, and you look at the number of primary PCI calls, or STEMI calls, I'm sorry, STEMI calls in 2020, you will find a dramatic fall in the number of calls for STEMIs and procedures done for STEMIs in 2021. Has STEMI suddenly decided to be less after COVID? In fact, there is evidence there are more uh, thrombotic events, including STEMI in COVID patients. And uh, the... Uh, the, and, and as a, this is one of those studies which showed that uh, the, the COVID uh, incidence is more and the mortality is higher. I mean, the mortality was 15% in patients who had COVID and STEMI as opposed to 11%. And possibly part of the reason is, you remember the days when, when, uh, when we're doing a primary PCI for STEMI, uh, we used to wear something like this, which was extremely uncomfortable. A patient had to go through many hurdles before uh, he's diagnosed. And if he's diagnosed, goes through many hurdles to make sure he doesn't infect anybody else. And there was a total chaos in many hospitals of how to deal with STEMI patients when we don't know whether this patient has COVID or not. At that time, there were no vaccination. Uh, vaccination. The treatment was uh, conflicting. Huge numbers of patients in CCUs. ICUs are uh, loaded with uh, COVID. All these factors have reduced the number and made it more difficult for patients, STEMI patients. So the STEMI patients of uh, 2020 were probably the most unlucky uh, STEMI population since the start of thrombolysis and primary PCI. Anyway, um, COVID can affect the, the heart in many ways. These are some of the potential mechanisms where myocardial injury can happen because or in association of COVID. The obvious one is uh, STEMI, uh, thrombosis type 1 myocardial infarction, but also severe hypoxia can give 
type 2 myocardial infarction. There could be a direct injury, myocardial injury from the viral infection. There is a lot of inflammatory response beyond the, the lungs. Uh, there is increased metabolic demand. There is also microvascular th uh, uh, thrombosis, endothelial dysfunction, and not to forget the recognized higher incidence of pulmonary thromboembolism. Uh, there is also stress cardiomyopathy, the Japanese uh, cardiomyopathy, which is associated with mortality. So in conclusion, uh, my colleagues, my expert panel, uh, my moderator, number one, primary PCI is superior, superior to fibrinolysis and S elevation myocardial function. This statement is largely true, but it's not 100%. Please remember that early fibrinolysis is better than late primary PCI, perhaps with the exception of cardiogenic shock, where primary PCI uh, fibrinolysis does not offer much advantage. Uh, time to presentation, risk profile, risk profile of the patient, whether the primary, the primary PCI facility, uh, durable time records are all important factors to decide reperfusion. Door balloon, door to balloon time uh, should be less than 90 minutes if you transfer the patients. If the patient arrives on primary PCI facility, should aim for less than 60 minutes. Uh, it's important that the emergency medical services, the hospital staff, the doctors, the nurses, the cath lab are, are, uh, are all working together to reduce the door to balloon time to the minimum possible to achieve the maximum benefit to the patient. Transfer to a primary PCI facility is preferred uh, if you don't have uh, primary PCI on site, but if it is going to be more than 120 minutes, give fibrinolysis. As for the patient, because patients are also part of the delay. You remember the first part is the patient delay before he reached us. That is important. One third of patients with myocardial infarction think their chest pain is because of indigestion and they don't come to the hospital and think things get worse. So awareness, education of the public and health professionals are very important measures to reduce the patient and the system delays. COVID, as I've just shown you, has made a negative impact on many aspects of STEMI, but I think now with massive vaccination, uh, and easing up of many of the rules, and now people more practical and more uh, logical about handling uh, the, uh, the patients is uh, making it come back or go back to its bright days of success. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm sorry if I have taken longer than what I should have done. بارك الله فيك دكتور عبد الرزاق وصراحة محاضرة يعني outstanding superb و زي ما قلت لك أنا have high expectation وصراحة يعني كنت في المستوى وأعلى الصراحة و I like the historical perspective اللي حطيته معلومات جديدة على الفكرة عليا ف thank you so much it was a nice flavor طبعا في في few points حركزوا عليهم في ال في ال discussion I'm gonna involve the expert panel أول حاجة بنعطي المايك للدكتور عبد الغني بعدين دكتور محمود يا ريت كل واحد منكم two minutes يعقب على المحاضرة دكتور عبد الغني the main take home point لواحد medicine resident practicing شن تبي يعرف على الموضوع هذا شن تبي the message اللي يطلع بهم المحاضرة دكتور عبد الغني وبعدين بنأخذ المحاور النقاش حنتكلم على ECG لأن في أسئلة ممتازة في ال expert panel بتكلموا بعجاله على موضوع التايمنج وبنتكلموا على موضوع المالتي فيزل بي سي اي عرج عليهم كلهم الدكتور عبد الغني بس ليتس كرييت سم دسكشن بالذات مع الداتا اللي الموجوده ببلش يعني فروم ذا ستادي فخلينا نبدا اي حد من الاتندنس لو عندك سؤال يا ريت ريز هاند نعطيك المايك تعلق او تكتبه في في الشات بوكس ونسال لنا الاكسبرت بانل ودكتور عبد الغني ويا ريت لاي حد في المشاركه وعنده سؤال يخليه في نطاق الموضوع ما بوش نمشوا تو ماتش ادفانس 
وحاجات متفرعه خلينا في نفس الموضوع لو عندكم تعليق على الهيستوري حتلحقها كويس دكتور عبد الغني تفضل الاول تقدر تدير ان ميوت دكتور عبد الرزاق قصك يا ايمن الدكتور عبد الرزاق الشهاد انت تبي تفضل ولا تبيني انا ابو نواره تفضل علق الو ايمن تسمع فيا؟ اي عبد الغني تفضل نسمع فيك انه تعقبك انت تو مينت على المحاضره وانت شنو المين بوينت اللي تبي اي حد يسمع المحاضره يطلع بهم من اليوم، بعدين نمشي لمحمود وناخذ شويه اسئله ونرجع للدكتور عبد الرزاق. تسمع فيا ايمن؟ واضح تفضل. ايوه السلام عليكم. مشكور جدا دكتور عبد الرزاق الله يبارك فيك. اكسلنت برزنتيشن، ون اوف ذا بيست اي هاف ايفر هيرد اونستلي. فيري سمبل بيزك تو ذا بوينت. Comprehensive. I can't really say, um, and it, it won't be enough to say good words about this presentation. Historical sites, it's very nice to uh, share with us. <laughs> a few points basic history, basic history, and physical exam. Quickly, very quick. ECG. قعدت بسرعة ينضار بسرعة الـ ECG within 10 minutes تو تكلم على حن... مش حنفوت 2 minutes ان شاء الله هنا الـ points هذه والـ ECG طبعا فيها الـ features بتاع الـ ECG عادة لازم تكون 2 consecutive leads except if you have AVR ST elevation with diffuse ST depression everywhere that's an exception sometimes we do take patients to the cath lab if we have ST elevation with AVR but you have to have diffuse extensive uh, ST depression elsewhere زي ما وراها الدكتور عبد الرزاق هذه معناها ليفت مين والله تريفيسال ديزيز بروكسيمال ال دي ونيو ليفت باند برانش بلوك مش ليفت باند برانش بلوك مش اي نو ذا بيشنت هاز ليفت باند برانش بلوك بريزنت ود تشيست بين لا ديفرنت نيو ليفت باند برانش بلوك ود تشيست بين ذاتس اولسو وي هاف تو كونسيدر از ا هاي ريسك وي تيك ذيم تو ذا كات لاب الحاله الثانيه هي ليت بريزنتيشن اس تي اليفيشن ماي سام تايمز يو نو تشيست بين او تشيست بين لايك 6 اورز 10 اورز وذ ديفيوز كي ويفز If the current patients still have chest pain, we think it's high risk. We take them to the cath lab. If not, we deal with the patient clinically. Based, usually, they come with stable elevation, but chest pain is actually completely subsided. Those patients, we didn't need to take them to the cath lab right away, but we have to take them as soon as possible afterwards, especially if they come late in the middle of the night. Uh, high risk non-stable elevation in my. One of the cases that is high risk non-stable elevation in my. If the case is chest pain, with no stable elevation, like and under other high risk features, especially cardiogenic shock. We have also to to go directly to the cath lab as soon as possible, usually uh, right away. Um, quickly, I covered patients. Uh, Dr. Abdurzak covered it very well. Like in Huma, can we go to the beginning? We could not know what to do. We could not find thrombolysis. Can an exception for those patients? If you think you might infect lots of people, and if you have the infection control is not that good in your facility, so just give those patients thrombolysis. It's better than to wait and discuss and what to do about this patient, uh, to take them to that lab or not, wasting time. Give them thrombolysis within 10 minutes and then discuss after a few hours if hopefully it will be successful or do a rescue BCI afterwards. But don't just keep the patient waiting with COVID, what to do about this patient. The last thing here, the vaccine, COVID vaccine, myocarditis, will be a severe chest pain or post of troponin. Very high uh, elevated troponin. Those patients uh, are common, young patients, nothing to worry about them, nothing to be done, usually just to observe them, do an echo, usually echo is normal, and uh, nothing else to be done. So, how did you get to the goal? How, inshallah, can be a serious side, inshallah. Thank you, Abdul Ghani. And in the next one, I will talk about Dr. Abdul Zaghi, and I will talk about the history of physical, and the history of physical, very focused, I mean, on the main, because you are. زي ما قال الدكتور عبد الرزاق you don't want to waste time time is a muscle every minute is a muscle في كل هيستم تاعك very focus وقصة انك انت you don't wait for the troponin يعني نفس الشيء نشوف اكثر من مره ان في واحد يبدا است elevation واضح ويقول لا التروبونين قاعد ما جاش ما تستناش هذا التايم كله يعني مصل اتجبره دي فايت ا فيري كروشيال بوينت يعني هذه اي ثينك ادفايس يعني مهمه جدا جدا تعقيب ممتاز من عبد الغني محمود ناخذ تعليق منك وبعدين بنمشي زي ما قلنا الاسئله في اسئله ممتازه على موضوع الاي سي جي والترومبوليتيك التايمينج واسئله على موضوع المالتي فيزل بي سي اي فون نان كالبريت وفي مجموعه اسئله ثانيه حتى نطرقوا لها بخصوص التايمينج فور بي سي اي افتر الترومبوليتيك تفضل محمود 
وبعدين في عندنا مجموعة عندها أسئلة تفضل يا فانتاستيك دكتور عبد الرزاق ذا واز اكسلنت اي ليرند ا لوت اند اي نو يو بروبابلي ون اوف ذا موست اكسبيرينس جايز اراوند هير يو ات ذا بيزيست ستمي سنتر اي ثينك ان ذا هول ميدل ايست ات حمد سو سو ذس از سمثينج وي كان فاليو يور اكسبيرينس يو نو اي ثينك يو ميد اول ذا كي بوينتس اي اي لاف ذا بوينت اباوت that the uh, most important thing is to reperfuse. I, just, I think we see that a lot in, in different areas where, you know, a very delayed PCI is worse than a rapid fibronolysis and thrombolytics. So I think that's very important if you don't have a cath lab available, rapid thrombolytics instead of trying to delay and take two hours to get to a PCI was, is, uh, is a critical point um, in this. I think the, you know, the, uh, The issue of uh, the history is important. When probably the most false alarms I see is uh, when the patient's not having chest pain with EKG changes or, or, <laughs> or uh, non-cardiac symptoms. So, you know, the EKG is one component and then the patient in front of you uh, is the other. And so if you have, you know, sometimes most common false activation is, is a J-point elevation with uh, a patient that's pretty comfortable. So, uh, so I would just make sure that, you know, the history and the, the patient and the, and the EKG have to, have to be uh, reviewed together when we're making decisions on these patients. Um, that's, I think those are the two points I wanted to make. I, I think there's plenty of good questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to Amy. We have, we have a lot of questions. Thank you, Mahmoud. There's a lot of questions. I read the Dekatra on the fast. I'll answer them for example. There's a question from Dr. Rajab. He said, the question The ECG that you asked Dr. Abdelzak about the left main pattern when you have diffuse ST segment depression in six lead or more, we have ST elevation in AVR and V1 and ST elevation AVR more than V1. This is a global ischemia, left main pattern, severe ischemia thrombosis. Gag, do you give a thrombolytic to such patient, Dr. Abdelzak, then Abdel Ghani and Mahmoud? As I told you, let's go to the speed so we can give them the answers. I think. Uh, the, gu the guidelines are the same. Uh, so if you can get this patient safely and quickly to a primary PCI, then that's the best. But if you can't, give them thrombolytic therapy. And this is one of the patients who should transfer to primary PCI facility as soon as possible after fibrinolysis. So if this patient, uh, you give him thrombolysis and he feels comfortable and the, ST change, the segment changes improve, Don't sit on this patient. This is a patient that, so the only, the only thing about this difference is these patients should be transferred very, very quickly, quicker than anybody else. It does, well done. Well, you give well. up, you know, no. Yeah, well said. If you can transfer to PCI quickly, do it. If not, yes, thrombolytic is appropriate in such patients, sah? And transfer to, pre -primary, uh, to PCI center as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Guideline, go like, yeah, I mean, three hour to 24 hour, like in those patients, it's a little more than 24 hour patient. Mumtaz. Abdul Ghani and Mahmoud, if you don't want to add to this point, in terms of the left main, sorry, in terms of the left bundle, there's a question on the left bundle, the same thing, I'm going to give you a new answer to the chest pain, and you'll find the left bundle branch block. Thrombolytic or no thrombolytic, what do you have advice clinically? And as I said, Mahmoud, You treat the patient, not the ECG. Yeah, and ECG one element. Had the guidelines, and I would it's the onset of symptoms within 12 hours. Michel Q wave, Michel ST elevation. It's the onset. They're a very liable information. So left bundle, Mahmoud, and then Abdul Ghani. Yeah, in terms of left bundle, if it's a, a new left bundle, you treat it as a as a STEMI. Um, you know, again, the, the the false positive rates of left bundle is higher. So I think if, the, but if the patients come to you with crushing chest pain and a left bundle, it's a STEMI until proven otherwise. So, so they get thrombolytics or primary PCI, uh, preferably if, if available. Abdul Ghani? Uh, I agree. I agree with Dr. Abdul Razak and Dr. Mahmoud. And even in the case of the first Dr. Abdul Razak, in all of these always we have to think about thrombolysis and primary PCI are, you, are going parallel. So if you can't give thrombolysis, you have to transfer, if you can't do a PCI, you have to transfer, uh, give thrombolysis quickly and transfer and vice versa. So, Mahmoud, chest pain or ECG not clear, like in the Kalmuk, uh, can we take him to privacy and go, let's take thrombolysis if this is a patient 
of yours are you going to give, give them thrombolysis now marathi go like la there is no steel vision go why are you calling us now so the, that's a good question that I always think is this patient uh, eligible for prime pci is this patient eligible for thrombolysis if prime pci is, is available then send the patient lift bundle bunch block we have to keep on mind always has to be new to be eligible so in the system, we have a good ECG system. We go tell them, always look at the old ECG quickly, please compare it. If it's a new, give thrombolysis, given the history, obviously, typical cardiac chest pain. If not the new, old lift bundle, then we treat as usual. Will the uh, with diffuse depression with the AVR is, uh, steel elevation is, is the same way. وعادة عبد الغني والكلام للجميع ما تنساش المرضى اللي بيجوا بالستيمي يكون فيري سيفير تشست بين يعني في اكسبشن بس ان جنرال يو كان تيل ذا فيري سيك يعني لما بدات الليفت باندل انت يو توكن اباوت لارج اير في سكيما اند كروسز ذا كوندكشن سيستم فبيشنتس فيري سيك اون شوكي يعني مش مش ستيبل وحاجه ثانيه نضيف حاجه ايمن هي السكربوز كرايتيريا حرام المفروض كلنا نعرفوها السكربوز كرايتيريا في الليفت باندل ولا اولسو في البيس ريذم Lift bundle, branch block, and ventric based rhythm. We have to read about scarposa criteria. It's it's common. It's not uncommon nowadays. Just last week, I saw a couple of patients with that scarposa positive criteria lift bundle. That would be very helpful to us. The value, the value, Doctor Abdelzak, the value of scarposa criteria to decide this lift bundle is STEMI or not. And the other question on the same, على موضوع ال 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 lift bundle. Will uh, yani one questionable how valuable doing a troponin from your experience to tell this is a STEMI or not? Um, it's a complex question. <laughs> Frank, Frank, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think here there's a call of judgment. Uh, and every patient is possibly different. But if I am convinced that uh, this patient's symptoms and the risk profile he has are highly suggestive of an acute MI. I think it will do no harm to take him to primary PCI. You may do harm if you give him thrombolysis. You see what I'm, what I'm saying? So for these patients, there is extra indication or extra point in favor of taking him to the cat lab. Uh, the, the, point, the point, Dr. Abdelzak, in, the, in the primary PCI, it has a diagnostic and therapeutic. Let thrombolysis just therapeutic. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, and also uh, you you don't in primary PCI you don't give the patient anything as harmful or as potentially harmful as the fibrinolytic therapy for before you make diagnosis. Uh, unfortunately, with fibrinolysis, you give it and then you might find you were wrong. Um, so if you uh, therefore, uh, what I'm saying, and I said this by the way to the guidelines committee um, of the European Society. I said, if I have primary, if this patient with left one branch block, I don't know it's new or old, comes in, I'm convinced about the clinical picture, he has risk factors, and I have, I have cat lab, I will take him to the cat lab. And that will probably give, give me more light into the condition. Uh, he may have coronary artery disease unrelated to STEMI, but it will give me more light. I will be slightly more reluctant or uh, more calculating if it, I have to give thrombolysis, because then obviously uh, you might put the patient in some risk. My so my it, uh, and uh, by coming back to the criteria, uh, unfortunately, many fellows don't know the criteria and they're very di bit difficult to remember. Uh, so uh, many fellows don't apply them and unless you say to them, have you looked at that criteria? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll look at it now. Um, so the criteria and also the clinical picture and whether you have primary PCI facility, uh, take them to, to a cat lab it, it, and that will help you in diagnosis. The second part of the question, how often do you use a troponin to يعني, help you making decisions as a STEMI or not? Then I personally, I think it's, a, it's delaying the therapy. Mahmoud? Never <laughs> is the answer. Yes. And because it's too late by that time, it's going to take you 20, 30 minutes. So you've already made your decision. So if, uh, if, if you need the troponin, then, it, then, you're, then you don't think it's a STEMI. If it's a STEMI, if you think it's a STEMI, then you take them. Again, if you have primary PCI, you're taking them to the cath lab. Mahmoud, I don't know Abdul Ghani, Dr. Abdul Zakh, I'm talking about one of my mentors, يعني, I'm a current resident, يعني, he told me something. If the patient is still having chest pain, he has still viable myocardium. If you think it's a STEMI, treat it as a STEMI. 
فيعني اتس ريلاينج اون ذا هيستوري مور امبورتنت اون ذا كي مثلا كان في كويشن من ال... في الباك الشات الكي ويف الكي ويف از فيري انلايبل كود بي لايك شون اب ان 30 مينيت كود بي ان داي اور تو ف ف دونت دونت يعني ود هولد ثيرابي على الموضوع ده طبعا هنا في نقطه يا ريت انتم تاكدوها لي بس باش الاودينس يكونوا اندرستاندينج في كونسنسس انكم when you have a STEMI primary BCI is the gold standard. If, you, if it's not available, if you cannot send that patient within that 120 minute, thrombolytic therapy is also effective as far as there's no contraindication, صح? صحيح 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 And I mean, you know, if, there's, if transfer takes a long time and, and you know, that happens in a lot of the region and, and, and if it, so the one, you know, you have to be able to transfer quickly for primary PCI. So it's not just transfer to piece, primary PCI, but it has to be fast. So if it's not available, fast thrombolytics is, has clearly been shown to be better than slow uh, primary PCI, as Dr. Jani pointed out. Time, yeah, exactly, time, yeah. Time is important. هو أحيانا very rarely we do it here for the weather. لما يكون difficult weather, snow or something, we uh, say if you can't take the patient, please give thrombolysis for the safety and also for the uh, quick response. In this very primary BCI, uh, but in general, as as soon as possible, we'll بعدين send the patient. Uh, the thrombolysis, بعدين send the patient for primary BCI or cath after. أنا في نقطة من أكز عليهم وفي سؤال حنجوم من ال من ال chat box بعدين ناخذ أسئلة من الأودينس بنقول نقطة إنك أنت لما تكون on call you're not alone في عندك other colleagues show them the EKG if you're in doubt text send the text of the EKG to a colleague to cardiologist you know to someone you know يعني you don't have take that responsibility for the for that يعني crucial decision إن أنتوا عارفين ال 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 thrombolytic with prime PCI saves life Yani this is in cardiology, the main therapy we have that saves life, primary PCR for STEMI and ICD. Yani this is it's data very strong. For some such yani decision, it's okay to ask people. Mish'aid, yani sometimes like you're not sure, maybe very subtle is the elevation. Why you wait three, four hours, repeat on the EKG in two hours with a triple. No, and to ask some colleague who had experience. يعني عينين أربع عيون أحسن من زوز فهمتني كيف ولا ف keep that in mind يعني you're not alone you can ask for help show it الحاجة الثانية في some cases the time doesn't mean much مثال بسيط في دكتور عواطف عطتنا كيس قالت لنا patient with liver cirrhosis child bug score B esophageal varices low platelet 98,000 he got a STEMI فهنا يعني أنت this patient obviously high risk for bleeding if you do thrombolytic صح؟ فانت يو تراي تو جيت ذس بيشنت از سون از بوسيبل فور برايمري فور بي سي اي كاباسيتي اتس جونا تيك ان تو اورز اوفر نايت بس ذس از ذا بيست فور ذا بيشنت مش عارف لو في حد بيعلق على الاكزامبل هذا هل فيكم حد كومفورتبل جيفنج ترومبوليتيك لساتش بيشنت؟ ما كنا نعلق عليها بس صار شفت حاله زيها انا قبل ممكن اي هاف تو سام تايمز داوت الدايجنوسيس اونستلي اي واز كونسلتد تو سي ا بيشنت لايك I think 28 years old female with uh, acute uh, leukemia with steel elevation, like literally eight or seven millimeters steel elevation, diffuse, diffuse, like you can't doubt steel elevation. Platelets nine, I told them can't pee. It's impossible to have black rupture and thrombosis. Did you do everything? Did you do his potassium? So you know, potassium now come it's nine. So it's actually turned out to be hyperkalemia, causing a huge steel elevation. So sometimes you have to think about if a platelet is like this liver cirrhosis patient, um, we have to think about, and if the diagnosis is real, unfortunately it's a tough case. You can't do any, sometimes you can't do anything. Even, uh, even, uh, even primary PCI is risky for this patient. I would do exactly. antiplatelet therapy and all that. I mean, if you are, if it's me, I'll probably end up doing balloon only. This is the art of medicine. So, in cases, yeah. they don't fall in the guidelines. They get like just general guidance. Mazal mawdu al multi bezel bisa. Lekin khan akhdu adn fi al fi doctor al shayma. And has a question. Tandi lek an mute. Tfadli. Aiyoo salamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Aiyoo salam. Tfadli doctor al shayma. نشكركم على المحاضرة الرائعة. Um, my question is more related to the medication, um, dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, we heard that recently about clopidogrel resistance. I just want to know, like, how frequent we see actually clopidogrel resistance in practice, and do we actually have any tests to detect that? Uh, if so, do we do that before, like, selection the um, agents, or that after filling the regimen? 
and that's uh, my question. شكرا اظني دكتور عبد الرزاق انت كنت موجود اول ما طلع الكلوب دي جريل صح؟ بيفور فبلاش السؤال هذا ليك انت وبعدين خلي عبد الرزاق عبد الغني ولا محمود يعلقوا عليك اوكي اوكي ويل ليسن ذير ار ديفينتلي ذير ار هيماتولوجيكال ستاديز ويتش شو ذات كلوبيدجريل ريزيستنس از ا رياليتي هاو كومن اند ذيس ا ديفرنت بيتوين ريسز اند اول ذات Uh, all these questions, but in general, in general, it's not recommended to do uh, clopidogrel studies before you start clopidogrel. Otherwise, it will be a massive cost. Um, if you, if uh, how would you think? How would you suspect clopidogrel uh, resistance? <laughs> the patient has to develop stent thrombosis before he can think that maybe he has. That's why I think this is reason. that the, uh, both the European and the American college are emphasizing Prasugrel and Kegrelol uh, for STEMI primary PCI. And I suspect, I suspect even for fibrinolysis, it might come. The only worry about fibrinolysis is that early on when the fibrinolysis do, uh, activity is high, to give these potent uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, may increase the risk of bleeding. So maybe, maybe the guidelines will come and say, after thrombotherapy, give clopidogrel for a week and then switch off, switch on to one of the other two, partly to avoid clopidogrel resistance. As far as I know, there is no uh, consistent data to, uh, uh, to suggest Resistance to the other prasugrel and uh, ticagrelol, as far as I know. So okay. yes, it exists. Difficult to uh, predict it, and it's impractical to be testing. Doctor Abdel Zaghi, I think brought very good point. I mean, I think I'm sure I've taken the board question. It's a common uh, cardiology board question. Patient post-thrombolytic, what antiplatelet uh, uh, agent uh, recommended? As far as right now, it's only Plavix. And at the time, that was available. Yani with the new, with PCI, there's no much data uh, in, in, in patient with the, who received thrombolytic on Tigergrel or Prasugrel. There's Dr. Basim, the Baroon Interventional Cardiologist. There's a trial called TREAT trial. showed in that Tigergrel is safe Uh, in early on patient with lysis patient. For example, one study. For example, I said to you, you can will change a little bit. But as right, right now, the only approved is the Plavix. We talk about Abdul Ghani on this topic. The story of the PPI and the clopidogrel. And this is what comes to a request from a patient. He says, the pharmacist of you, he says, how the doctor of you put you on the omeprazole and you take the clopidogrel. What are you talking about on this topic? فعلا كانت كانت بيج ديلما فيو ييرز اجو لكن خلاص في سيفرال ستاديز دان وشود ان اكشلي اتس سيف تو يوز بي بي اي وذ بي تو واي 12 انهبيتور سبيشلي بافكس كلوبيد جريل اند فيجرلو سو ات واز مينلي وذ ميبرازول بيفور بات ناو وي وي اند اكشلي ذير از ا ستادي اكشلي وذ وذ ذات اند بنتابرازول And so it's actually safe. So here in our center, we use pentabrazole regardless all the time, have no, no contraindications. And actually it's proven that giving uh, PPI with dual antiplatelet therapy to reduce GI bleeding, the most common cause of bleeding is GI bleeding. And by giving them PPI at the same time, you prevent bleeding, you prevent interruption of dual antiplatelet therapy and indirectly prevent stent thrombosis. So uh, it's, it's, it's really <laughs> important <laughs> that we keep that. بالمناسبة يعني أنا لما have a patient with the ACS acute coronary syndrome stimulant STEMI before they go home I make sure they're on PPI when they go on that يعني اللقطة اللي برات تب دكتور بس مشكور حطنا حتى هو ال ال link بتاع هذه ال ال treat trial محمود خليك تأخذ السؤال الجاي لو ما عندكش تعقيب من دكتورة هنا تفضل دكتورة هنا تبي تسأل سؤالك وبعدين دكتور محمود النايلي مش عارف دكتورة حنان خلاص بين ناخذ دكتور محمود تفضل دكتور محمود نلتجا دكتورة حنان um, thank you very much guys I'm not sure if you can hear me yeah تفضل نسمع فيك انا جزاك الله خير 
Um, very quick question, um, really about the infrastructure in Libya and the question about the feasibility of performing primary PCI versus um, performing a pharmacoinvasive, which is different than facilitated PCI. Because this problem we do face a lot in, our, in, in the country where I got my training in. And um, it's actually very helpful to focus on pharmacoinvasive which really showed in, in the stream trial that it is non-inferior to primary PCI if it's done correctly and promptly, meaning performing the PCI within three to 12 to 24 hours after the fibrinolytic therapy, instead of doing it like in a facilitated PCI. Um, I'm not sure how frequent primary PCI is done in Libya, but I think it's um, difficult because of the um, lack of the infrastructure to do that. And, um, you know, the merits of managing failed or failed P uh, fibrinolytic therapy and performing the rescue PCI and how to diagnose that. I think that's probably more, you know, more important for the audience, the target audience for this talk. But in general, I mean, we uh, I'm really appreciated the, the excellent talk from Prof. And um, thank you guys for, for letting me participate. شكرا محمود بارك الله فيك هو شوف ما فيش حد هنا كان دكتور عاد المنتصر معنا لكن اعتذر في اخر لحظه هو على الكول ستيمي شكله جهته ستيمي لو في حد من زملاء في ليبيا لكن انا عندي 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 معلومات ان في في بروبوزل لوزاره الصحه ان يندار ستيمي كول ياخذوا ون سنتر مثلا في طرابلس اللي نعرفه هنا حيكون مصلاك لمركز طرابلس الطبي بحكم موجوده في وسط المدينه ان هو يكون برايمري بي سي اي سنتر و they have other interventional cardiologists to take a call a day هذا في في بروبوزل حاليا يشتغلوا عليه زي ما قلت انت يعني الانفراستراكشرز والموضوع حياخذ ان شاء الله حتكون خطوه يعني ممتازه تو بروفايد يعني هاي كواليتي كير وان شاء الله يا رب يوفقهم الزملاء في ليبيا لان عارفين الشغل في ليبيا شويه صعب قصه الانفراستراكشر والسبورت للكوادر الطبية مش يعني في المستوى اللي نتمنون نشوفه فهذه الإجابة دكتورة حنان تقدر تتكلم أنت وتعطي سؤالك Yeah, it, it, it is, um, I have a few comments The first one is, I'm I agree with Dr. Mansour is regarding the pharmacoinvasive I think most reliable now in the Libya especially I was there in the last two years So especially Libya geographically is big and the center it is, for example, in Benghazi I believe it's there is three centers near to each other while in you're going to the Baida and they manage and it's more than 200 kilometers so you couldn't find any center. Now just they started doing one in El Baida which is uh, still not working in primary BCR just done by the visitor from Benghazi. And yeah, so my question also regarding to the Dr. Abdelazik regarding comparing, we have heard from him regarding to the mortality comparing with the primary BCI to thrombolysis. I'm just asking about the mortality regarding to pharmacoinvasive comparing with the primary BCI, what's the mortality and the bleeding? I can't remember the figures, but uh, it, uh, it compares. Yeah, approximately, I know, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would, uh, PCI is I'll, the king. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it, but I know that it it uh, it compares very favorable uh, to uh, primary PCI. Uh, I can't remember the exact figures. Uh, when I don't remember, I, I don't say I don't make it up. But the Dr. Ghani, it's definitely lesser mortality and lesser bleeding. That's why it's comparing to. Uh, نعم نعم يا ديفنتلي لس لس مرتالتي انا في تو شوي يمكن يصير كونفرونتيشن بيني وبين الدكتور عبد الرزاق والدكتور طيب عبد الرزاق انت وان سلايد حطيت ان البرايمر بي سي اي تايمينج از 60 مينيت انا ريمبر وين اي واز ان تريننج ات واز 60 مينيت فور بي سي اي كابل هوسبيتال بس ذن دي ابديتد ذا جايد لاينز ذي سيز 90 بيكوز ذير از نو ديفرنس ان مرتالتي طبعا بحكم انك انت قبلنا كنا يعني انت تخرجت من الطب في ال 1982 صح؟ لو دفتك صح؟ انا كان عمري سنتين كان عمري سنتين فوضعي صعب شويه لكن عندي باك اب الجايد لاينز فشين بتقولي على السلايد هذيك اللي اوكي اي دليف اي دليف اي نيو اي اي نيو اي نيو سمبدي ويل بريك ذا بالون مش تعرف كنا نسمع احنا ما كناش راقدين لا لا يا يا اي نو اي نيو اي نيو سمبدي ويل بريك ذا بالون 
but I, I deliberately insist on keeping this 60. I honestly, deliberately, and if I can make it 30, I, I will. But um, I think primary PCI uh, should not, a primary PCI center receiving the patient to their door uh, should not be the same as somebody being transferred. Uh, this is what I believe. I know now yes, it's 90 many, minutes, uh, and it's, it's, not, it's, it's 90 minutes, everybody, but I, I still feel that 60 minutes should be kept. The sooner the, sooner uh, the and, better. And even if they can challenge it to 45 minutes or 30 minutes, they should. Uh, in, in, in our hospital, it's 26 minutes, so it's possible. We are not the best, and we can make it 26 minutes, so it can be, it can be done. It can be done for sure, uh, Dr. Abdurza, I agree with you 100%. Actually, we had some talks with colleagues from Mayo Clinic, and their door to balloon time is 30 minutes. That's standard, 30 minutes in my, just near like, well, it's 45 minutes from, from our center here. We had the communication with them, and that's their standard, 30 minutes. Yeah, and the same with the AHA push has been, they've, they've moved the target to be less than 60. The, 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 the mandatory is less than 90, but even the AHA recommends a less than 60 time frame as a target uh, for your average in a, in a cath lab. In the US currently, the current average is in the 50, 57 minutes, I think. Yeah, to your point, uh, Mahmoud, uh, so, uh, so, 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 so my, my, my balloon is saved, huh? <laughs> you're, you're ahead of the curve, Dr. Jim. Oh, 27 uh, minutes, that's amazing. I can't believe that. Our cat really left 54 minutes, our average cat left. He, he, from uh, first contact to, uh, to uh, the balloon, there is a little bit of 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 a little bit you fix it, everything is good. You, you inject the coronaries, the right side, like example, you want Dr. Abdul Razak, take an proximal RCA 90% lesion. In the past, in 20, 2011, STEMI guidelines, it was class three indication. That means it's harmful, you should not do it. But then for 2013, 14 updated guidelines, they move it to class 2B, Man, it's reasonable to do it, but I the primary trial or other trial. But then the trial is Mahmoud in the guidelines, it could be, you can use, and you can treat in non-culprit if the patient's hemodynamically unstable or in shock. Like in the trial, it's a shock trial, PCI shock trial showed and if you do it in the same index procedure those patient they have worse outcome with even re uh, dialysis you know too much uh, contrast but i can't big trial i think around 200 300 the most or fee for 2017 and the uh, complete trial 4000 patient they said no 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 you should fix the non culbert lesion if it's significant but not in the index procedure yani النقطة اللي بنوضحها هنا باش للأودينس اللي مش فاميلر مع الترايل هادم في الشاك ترايل النان كالبرت دي انترفين on the index procedure مع البرايمري بي سي اي نفس الشيء باش نقوم يطلع من الكاتلاب it fix the lesion في الكمبليت ترايل it was not done on the same index whether the next day before discharge of 45 days محمود يريد تعلقنا على النقطة هادي لأن شوية confusing لي someone who's not comfortable very common there's data up to 50% patient with STEMI they have multivisual disease yeah, so so I mean, this has big, big, been the probably the biggest area of study in the STEMI groups over the last probably eight years, nine years since the primary trial first came out, and then followed by the culprit and the uh, compare Q trial and the complete trial. So the I think the over the preponderance of evidence is very clear that in STEMI with multivessel disease, complete revascularization decreases events and outcomes, and patients should get complete revascularization in the STEMI population. All of these trials excluded shock. So every single one of those big trials, the biggest one was the, uh, was, was the complete trial excluded shock patients. The best one trial for shock patients was the uh, culprit shock trial, which is a very well done, probably the largest trial ever done in shock patients. I think they had 700 patients. So it wasn't that small. And that one actually showed that doing multivasal PCI in the setting of shock acutely on the table during the initial intervention actually increased mortality 
an increased need for dialysis. So I, I think in the current uh, data and uh, is the uh, algorithm is shock multivessel disease uh, sorry, multi, semi with multivessel disease, you fix the non culprit usually in a separate setting, um, though some of the trials did include in the same setting. But if you have shock, you stabilize the patient, take care of the culprit, put them on mechanical circulatory support and let them recover. And then, and then you can address those later on down the line, but doing them in the same setting increases mortality. Uh, Basim, be honest answer. Saat lata fil 3 a.m. الدير في ستيمي ال دي والجيت ار سي اي شنو حدير؟ الستاندرد اوف براكتس وال وات وي يوجلي دو از بي ستيج ذيم وي يوجلي ستيج ذيم از ان اوت بيشنت ذا بيجست ترايل از ايفري ون منشن ذا كومبليت ترايل واز ات واز ستاديد ستيج بي سي اي فيرسز نو فيرسز انكومبليت ريفاسكولاريزيشن اند ذات شو ذات ذير واز بينيفيت ان ستيجينج ذا كولبريت اند ذا برايمري ترايلز وير سمولر ستاديز They're randomized trials, but they showed that complete revascularization was also better than incomplete revascularization. But their strategy was a little bit different from the complete trial in that all the PCI was uh, revascularization was done in the same setting. And that did not show harm. So we don't have a study comparing complete revascularization in one setting versus staged complete revascularization. Interestingly, in the complete trial, the stage was done, uh, it was stratified either as an inpatient or even as an outpatient. And interestingly, it did not show any difference. So all, I think all of those options are reasonable. Now, I practice in a province that has patients that take about eight to 10 hours to come down. And our uh, infrastructure in terms of beds is very tight. So occasionally in selected patients that, uh, as you described, not at 3 a.m., let's say at 3 p.m., where the patient took seven or eight hours to be transferred from another site was thrombolized, uh, well, thrombolized, and it's all, and, it's a, and the RCA is a 90% lesion that will take me 10 minutes to fa- fix. Occasionally, I would do the complete revascularization at the same setting, saving the system some, uh, some strain from, from a repeat procedure. But that's in selected cases. But the standard practice is to usually stage the, stage the second lesion. شكرا باسم لو عندك تعقيب في اخر سؤال بناخذه عليه الرول اوف فيابيلتي ستادي ان ستيميليت برزنتيشن ويا حد منكم يعلق حتى على الستيتش ترايل يكون عندنا ايفيدنس سبيس بعدين التيك هوم مسج من 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 كل الاكسبيرت بانل بما فيهم حضرتك يا باسم ونختموا باستاذنا دكتور عبد الرزاق شن هي المين تيك هوم مسج اللي تبي اي حد جونيور في ليبيا يشتغل يشوف في حالات ام اي في الاي ار شن تبي المين هوم مسج اللي تعطيها له فخلينا من بياخذ السؤال هذا نتاع الفايبيلتي في الليت برزنتيشن ستيمي واحد ستيمي جي ليت افتر 1 2 دايز تشست بين اوكي اي تيك اف ذا بيشنتس هافينغ تشست بين ذا هاف فايبيلتي سو ذاتس فيرست سو اف ذي ار ستيل هافينغ اون جوينغ سيمتومز اي دونت ثينك ذير از اني رول ناو اف ا بيشنت هاز ا كومبليتد انفارك اي ثينك ذا ذا او ترايلز بريتي كلير اف اتس مور ذان دي 3 after revascularizing a totally occluded vessel um, doesn't have any, any clinical benefit. So then, then you know, in a, in a more stable setting, whether, whether revascularizing for viability is a different story, but, but in the STEMI setting, if they're having chest pain, they're viable. If they're not having chest pain, then, and it's an occluded vessel, there's no real role for, uh, for intervention. Yeah, very good point. Abdul Ghani, let me um, read that. that. لما يكون بيد هذا مع كارديومابتي وي جيت ثري فيزل ديزيز وتبي تبعت على الكبج هل تبعت الكبج دايركتلي او دي لا فيابيلتي بعدين ناخذ دكتور باسم وزي ما قلنا يعني دكتور عبد الغني باش يعطينا هيز وورد اوف ويزدوم وتيك هوم مسج كويس يا انترستنج انف التو ستاديز البيج ستاديز يو منشند اي اي واز ان دايركتلي انفولف اي واز دورينج ماي ترينينج اي واز انفولف وذ ذا ستيتش ترايل دورينج ماي اكشلي ناو years ago here in Hamilton, the complete trial came out. I have lots, lots of my patients involved in that. Uh, and uh, complete, exactly, I agree with, with the passing for the complete trial. Fix the complete, uh, the culprit, leave the other one to another day, preferably the same admission or within less than 40, 45 days. So complete revascularization is, uh, is, be- is better, definitely, after prime VCI, but do, don't do it in the same setting. For the viability <clears throat> based on the stitch trial, there is no benefit from doing it. Uh, I, I don't do it anymore for my patients. 
I depend primarily on the history, physical, and on the echo. Um, sometimes um, we, we do um, assist patient uh, just with medical therapy and see. If you have clear evidence of ischemia, definitely, and you have the, um, the clear, um, obviously there'll be LV dysfunction and, and there's uh, echinesis on the echo, then that's, that's the question when the surgeon will say, can I do? This is this a viable or not? It's it's not clear to us yet. And from the stitch tie, I would say just no need for that. And you treat it based on the other criteria, but just to do viability and then send. I I, th I I tend to send patients for surgery if I think they need surgery based on what I have from criteria. I don't send them for viability study, and that's what we do here in our center. So just treat medically aggressive medical therapy. If they have vessels that need to be vascularized, try to do it with PCI, if not with, with surgery, regardless. And usually we see improvement in the LV function. It's very interesting. Even if you do viability, sometimes they say, oh, no, it's not viable, but we send them for, for revascularization and, and it, LV function improves partially, not completely, obviously, but partially. Abdul Ghani, we have to take the input of the bus, but we have to take the Abdul Zag. And then when we do a round, we have the genie case, they had him to late STEMI. ولو اي اف وتري فيزل ديزيز الفيلو يبدا يقول لي خلاص وي جو دو فايبلج ستادي وي كول سيت سيرجن يقول لك جود ايديا لوك اب ستيتش ترايل كيب بيشنت ام بي او تو نايت ولوك اب ستيتش ترايل تومورو مورنينج اف يو ثينك از يوزفول توك وذ ذا سيرجن اف يو دونت ثينك اتس ذيرز فاليو اي ونت فيد ذا بيشنت فكل نجي ثاني يوم نلقى البيشنت فاطر ويبدا الفيلو يضحك شويه يدير في ابتسامه هيك فاتس اتس ا جود واي to try to apply evidence-based medicine in our decision-making and we don't let the bias be what we think the right way. And here in surgeon, this is their way to move a patient. Yeah, they don't, a patient high risk, they don't want to do it. They say, let's do viability. If not, why I want to do that? But uh, a stitch trial, large, large trial. But I'm going to talk to you about this and we'll Dr. Abdelzak to give his word of wisdom and take home message. I don't think it's a good discussion. It's a great discussion. It's a great discussion. It's a great discussion. It's a great Yeah, no, uh, I think I agree, agree with uh, Abdul Ghani. I mean, uh, viability is, hasn't been shown to be very useful in guiding uh, clinical decision-making. So if a patient has multivessel disease and ischemic cardiomyopathy, I would just refer to, and, and the surgical candidate I'd refer to cardiac surgeon. Now, the surgeon might come back and decide that maybe viability because their, their risk of surgery is extremely high. If the surgeon wants that, that's fine. But I don't, I don't do that on my, uh, I don't trigger that uh, management on my, my own. Yeah. وبتتفق مع محمود البوينت اللي قالها ان if patient comes late after let's say 12 hour no chest pain completely good artery no value to open that صح يعني في في consensus yeah 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 in, in general the old trial showed that there is no uh, there is no benefit from uh, from opening up occluded vessels if the if the infarction has been completed completely uh, so that's so there is you know Once in a while, you'll get a patient who his chest pain has gone away, and when you cath them, it's uh, they have very brisk collaterals from the left system, for example, um, and the, the wall motion is not akinetic; it's only mildly hypokinetic. So that's a clinical judgment. But in general, a patient who presents with a late infarction, opening up the vessel is not beneficial and uh, and, is, and probably portends harm. شكرا طبعا للحضور دكتور باسم هو حيكون المودريشن المودريتر والمايسترو بتاع الانترفينشنال كارديولوجي اكسترا سيريس طبعا انا بسطته له بعد ما كملت مع الدكتور عبد الرزاق الجهاني فباسم وضعك شويه صعب بتجيب حد يعني يحافظ على الستاندر بتاع الدكتور عبد الرزاق شكرا للحضور الصراحه محاضره قيمه جدا جدا ونقاش ولا اروع شكرا دكتور محمود شكرا دكتور عبد الغني شكرا باسم وكل الزملاء اللي سالوا اسئله وشاركونا بالتشات بوكس طبعا مشكور جدا دكتور عبد الرزاق الصراحه يعني اتس ان اونر فور مي تو بي يو تو بي وذ يو اون ذس سيشن ايفن فيرشولي يعني انا لما فيرست تايم اي ميت يو في الليكشرز كنت يعني جاست فريش جراد ولوكن ات يو اب وناو الحمد لله يعني وير باك توجذر شيرنج ذا سيم بوديوم وديسكشن تو سبرين ذا نولج يعني انت الحمد لله يعني من البايونير Or your repetition procedure. Uh, we're looking for more, yani, to collaborate. Yani, if, uh, inshallah, yani, we would like to get most of you. Yani, hatta bil history, you know, you get out. Yani, the messages are beautiful. So, the word for you, if it's related to the last question, is the last one. Take a message, and then we'll finish. Thank you. 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 Th
Shukran. Um, I find usually the surgeons ask for the perfusion study uh, more often than us. Um, and I think the colleagues have covered all aspects of this. The take home message is what I said in conclusion is very simple. Um, don't miss the diagnosis of STEMI. Don't wait for troponin. Patients, if you can get patient in, uh, into primary PCI, or if you can do the primary PCI within the time frame stated, uh, that would be excellent. And that's the best chance for the patient. If not, as I said, and I'll say it again, early fibrinolysis is better than late uh, prim primary PCI, especially if the difference is big. Uh, um, the, uh, it's important that uh, you pay attention to dual antiplatelet therapy. I did not touch on uh, prevention after, secondary prevention after the event. Uh, that's very important because you find a patient, you do a wonderful stent or a wonderful bypass or whatever it is, and you don't pay attention or he doesn't pay attention or both of us don't pay attention to prevention. And in three years time, he's coming back with worse uh, uh, worst coronary disease. So it was just a transient uh, honeymoon for three years. So uh, that's basically, uh, if, if you can, if you have primary PCI center, make sure that everybody knows the steps and it's easy and flowing so the patient does get, doesn't get stuck uh, here or there and get delayed. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope, inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll meet again and again. Shukran, barakallahu feek. Assalamu alaikum.